thank you for viewing the presentation today. This was originally presented to the American Philatelic Society as part of their stamp chat series in June of 2020. This is a quote from Terrence Mann from Field of Dreams, originally about baseball. When I think of stamp collecting, the same words and thoughts apply. This cover by Fred Collins serves as a fitting title for today's presentation. My album pages of these two aviators are a favorite part of my airmail collection. In today's presentation, I will share my version of a concise history of Charles Lindbergh, a thumbnail history of Amelia Earhart, some examples of my airmail stamps and covers, and a review of the parallel traits of the two aviators. We celebrated 100 years of airmail service just a couple of years ago. For most collections, airmail is located in the back of the book. In my collection, airmail is first in volume one. This is a cover by Bob Emmerich with several examples of the Curtis JN1 Jenny biplane. The history of the most famous U.S. stamp, the inverted Jenny, is well known to collectors and the general public. In 2013, the U.S. Postal Service issued a souvenir sheet of six $2 Jenny inverts. This sheet was printed using plates created from the original 1918 dies. You can still order this sheet through USPS.com and take a chance on getting a rare sheet with the inverted aircraft inverted or right side up. 100 of the 2.2 million sheets were intentionally printed and are still being discovered. Less than half of the inverted sheets have been reported as found. This is the first airmail stamp issued in May of 1918, featuring that same Curtis Jenny. This centerline block of four is one of my favorites. It reminds me that my grandfather Turner was in the trenches in France in November 1918 when the shooting stopped. He was 20 years old with his whole life in front of him. The initial printing in 1918 had different margins on the top and bottom of the sheet. If you have a stamp with a straight edge on the bottom, you know it is from the bottom row of the initial printing. During the same year airmail started, Charles Lindbergh graduated from high school. Actually, he volunteered during the last year of World War I for the Farm Service Program to gain the credits needed to graduate. He enrolled at the University of Wisconsin to study engineering. He never earned a degree, leaving school in pursuit of his passion for aviation. History will not question that decision. He's pictured here in 1927 addressing the crowd of 40,000 at Camp Randall Stadium, who turned out to hear from the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic. Lindbergh's first plane was a Curtis Jenny, with only 70 horsepower and a ceiling of 1,700 feet. At that altitude, he would not be able to fly over the, the One World Trade Center in New York City. During his first solo, he practiced landing four times, once so hard it almost destroyed the landing gear. He spent time barnstorming and wing walking before enlisting in the U.S. Army flying cadet training. He graduated flight school first in his class, but the Army did not need active duty pilots so he returned to civilian life and made his first airmail flight. He carried mail with stamps like this one issued in 1926 on his flight. 
This stamp was issued specifically for the contract airmail rate of up to a thousand miles. Contract airmail was used to expand airmail services beyond the government's airmail routes. His first route was from Chicago to St. Louis. In the months leading up to the start of the service, Lindbergh surveyed the 278-mile route, establishing each of the four landing fields. He also selected nine additional emergency landing fields, each about 30 miles apart. He is pictured here after a crash later on the same route. Lindbergh did not, did not panic, but decided that if I could fly for 10 years before I was killed in a crash, it would be a worthwhile trade for an ordinary lifetime. He survived more crashes than any other airmail pilot, earning the nickname Lucky Lindy. He always recovered all of his crash mail to complete the delivery. He decided to pursue the Orteg Prize, $25,000 to the first Allied pilot to fly New York to Paris or vice versa. He helped design the Spirit of St. Louis aircraft flying cross-country before the transatlantic attempt. Look closely, the aircraft has no windscreen or forward view. The plane was custom-built to carry 450 gallons of fuel. Fully loaded, the plane weighed 5,100 pounds about the same weight as the average car of the time. The design of the plane made it naturally unstable to fly, a factor Lindbergh knew would help him stay awake during the long flight. Lindbergh refused to carry souvenir mail. He cut the top and bottom off of his map to keep the weight down on the plane. Taking off from Roosevelt Field on Long Island, New York, Lindbergh bounced twice on the muddy runway before finally clearing the telephone lines at the end of the field by 200 feet. He had a forward periscope that he could slide out of the left of the plane. This would be like setting up a remote camera, putting your phone on the dashboard, and painting your car windshield black, and then driving for a day and a half without stopping. It's hard to imagine what he experienced during the long hours of the flight. Isolation, darkness, storms. He reported having hallucinations of ghosts in the cockpit with him. He flew with the side windows open so the cold air would help keep him alert. At times, he flew low over the water to catch the ocean spray to wake himself. After nearly 34 hours, he completed the historic transatlantic flight. Americans wrote to Washington, D.C. in record numbers requesting a stamp to honor Lindbergh after the flight. The post office broke tradition by honoring a living person on a stamp, issued one month after the feat. It is believed to be the quickest production of an engraved stamp ever. This stamp was one in my original collection when I was seven years old. I have a wonderful memory of licking the hinge before applying it to the mint never hinged stamp. News spread as Lindbergh was over England and crowds started gathering in Paris. He was greeted by 150,000 people. He wrote, I was astonished at the effect my successful landing in France had on the nations of the world. It was like a match lighting a bonfire. Here is a plate block of six from a sheet of 50 stamps. Over 20 million of these stamps sold, with a large number of those going to collectors. A smart Frenchman placed Lindbergh's leather helmet on a reporter, allowing Lindbergh to escape to a nearby hangar. 
the U.S. ambassador took Lindbergh to his house, where Lindbergh was finally able to sleep after 63 hours. On the left is a complete booklet of 10 cent airmail stamps. This was the first airmail booklet issued. Collectors overlooked the booklet stamps, unaware that it was different from the sheet stamp. The cover added one cent to the price of the stamps for the booklet. Here is a booklet pane of three stamps. If you ever see one with the wide margin or selvage at the bottom, grab it. The Scott catalog value for a complete booklet like that is $11,000. The Spirit of St. Louis aircraft was returned home by a U.S. Navy cruiser. Lindbergh was greeted by huge crowds in Washington and New York, then toured the United States making 82 stops in 48 states in the aircraft. Lindbergh was world famous after the flight, as well known as Muhammad Ali today. Used examples of this particular booklet stamp are very rare. President Coolidge awarded him the first Distinguished Flying Cross. Here is a block of 12 stamps from a sheet of 50. He also learned earned the Legion of Honor medal from France. Here is a mint never hinged sheet of 50 stamps. This is a scarce first day of issue cover for the booklet paying stamp. Here is a first day of issue cover before the first day of issue cancellation was developed. Here is a cover actually flown by Charles Lindbergh on contract airmail route number two. President Coolidge presented Lindbergh with the Medal of Honor, awarded by an act of Congress on this date. The cover is autographed by the Washington, D.C. Postmaster. This is my absolute favorite piece of my entire collection. I also have a photocopy of the letter presenting the autographed cover to Mr. Chamberlain saying, here is the letter that Colonel Lindbergh autographed for you. I believe that is about as close as you can get to a certificate of authenticity in 1928. His cat, Patsy, flew with him in the cockpit regularly. He gave this response when asked, why didn't you take Patsy with you on the transatlantic flight? These stamps were issued by Spain. The error on the right omits Lindbergh's portrait. This is the 50th anniversary stamp for the transatlantic flight. They issued over 208 million copies of this stamp. The 50th anniversary cover, autographed by his youngest daughter, Reeve, a renowned author. She recalled, Charles didn't like manufactured holidays, like Mother's Day and Father's Day. The family didn't celebrate unless Charles was traveling during those holidays. A 50th anniversary crash cover from a stamp show in Illinois. To quote Lindbergh again, there is a saying in the service about the parachute. If you need it and haven't got it, you'll never need it again. That just about sums up its value to aviation. Lindbergh is featured on one stamp of the National Postal Museum commemorative set in the early 1990s. He is also featured in the Celebrate the Century series later in the 1990s. Because they were both tall, lanky aviation pioneers, Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart are often linked together in history. 
the alliteration Lucky Lindy becomes Lady Lindy for Amelia. This concludes part one of The Golden Eagles, Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart. Be sure to watch part two for Amelia Earhart and the comparison between the aviators. It has been a privilege and an honor to present this information to you today. Thanks very much for your time. Any questions or comments, please be sure to leave them in the space below. And don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of future presentations.